So I will start by saying good morning. I'm Debbie Lindis. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the manager for the healthcare delivery system group at the Office of Healthcare Affordability. And welcome to what is the 15th meeting of the OCA Investment and Payment Workgroup and our third meeting that's focusing on behavioral health investment. <clears throat> so thank you all for joining. And as usual, um, please introduce yourself in the chat with your name and your organization. And also, in case you're wondering why you're seeing a new face, um, I'm pinch hitting this morning with Margareta Brandt, who is presenting on our primary care work at a meeting of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, or NASEM, this morning. And she will um, join us shortly when that presentation wraps up. Um, so before I review today's agenda, I want to provide an update on our primary care investment work. So we're anticipating that OCA will present the primary care investment benchmark recommendation for approval at its next board meeting. And this board meeting has been rescheduled uh, to October 14th in light of Dr. Galley transitioning his role to Kim Johnson, who currently serves as director of the Department of Social Services. Director Johnson will be assuming the role of Secretary of Health and Human Services next month. Um, and in her new role, Secretary Johnson will join the OCA board at that time. Um, so in today's meeting, we'll introduce the behavioral health spending measurement framework and discuss some key decisions related to defining the claims-based portion of behavioral health spending. And after each agenda item, we will pause for questions and discussion. Um, so here's a quick recap of our meeting format. As a reminder, um, we appreciate and consider all the thoughtful comments you put in the chat during these meetings, and we ask that you provide your organizational affiliation with your comments. We might not be able to, res to respond to all of your comments during the meeting, but we do review all the chats and use them to inform our work going forward. Um, so here's our membership, and this month we would like to welcome Dr. Jeffrey Norris to the work group representing the Department of Healthcare Services. Um, I think you might have been here before, but Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, thanks, Debbie. Um, Jeff Norris, I'm a family medicine physician, and I, as was stated, am the value-based payment branch chief at DHCS. I oversee a lot of our uh, incentive payment programs at various levels in the Medi-Cal system and our value-based payment strategy uh, related work. Um, I came about a year and a half ago from the FQHC world where I ran an FQHC in a large clinically integrated network of eight FQHCs in uh, Southern California. I live and work in San Diego, not in Sacramento, um, and uh, glad to join you all. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and I also like to invite any other work group members who haven't yet been able to introduce themselves uh, to, to do so now. Okay. Great. So um, to to dive in, as a quick reminder, our behavioral health investment work is guided by our statutory requirements and goals that are outlined on these next two slides. We've reviewed these before, so I won't spend too much time on them, um, but just wanted to mention that at a high level, OCA is required to promote sustained system-wide investment in behavioral health care, and in doing so, to measure the per percentage of total health care expenditures that are allocated to behavioral health and to set spending benchmarks. In order to complete these tasks, we'll need to determine the diagnoses, providers, care settings, procedure codes, and non-claims payments that should be considered when determining the total amount spent on behavioral health. And as I mentioned earlier, decisions related to claims-based spending will be our focus today. OCA's mandate to measure and benchmark spending is a component of system-wide efforts to measure and improve health outcomes in California. And in the case of <clears throat> behavioral health, the statute requires us to promote models that integrate behavioral health with primary care and with broader social and public health services, to encourage the adoption of alternative payment models that enable improved access and team-based approaches to care, to help to reduce disparities in behavioral health, 
and to expand access using telehealth and other solutions. So one area of concern that's been raised by this work group, also by the board and the advisory committee, is that OCA's total healthcare expenditures data collection does not include out of plan spending. And this is of particular concern when measuring behavioral health spending because some payments to behavioral health clinicians and facilities may not be covered by insurance or patients may seek care outside of the provider network of their insurance. This sometimes happens because many providers prefer to remain outside of insurance networks and to charge patients directly. Benefit design, design decisions, such as limits on the number of visits that are covered by insurance, can also affect out-of-plan spending. So to shed light on the scope of this issue and its potential implications for policy, including behavioral health spending measurement, OCA proposes to uh, perform a supplemental analysis to estimate this out of plan spending. The supplemental analysis will estimate out of plan spending using the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey or MEPS, which is administered by the Federal Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. <clears throat> The MEPS household component is a large nationally representative sample of the civilian non-institutionalized population. Survey respondents are asked about their health insurance coverage and healthcare utilization and costs, including out-of-pocket spending. Spending in the MEPS household component is defined for each medical event, such as an office visit, an inpatient stay, or an outpatient visit. And for each event, the data collected includes payer types, such as private insurance, public programs, or self-pay, the type of provider, the diagnoses, and the procedures. So with these data fields, an analyst can aggregate the data to learn how much spending for behavioral health services came directly from patients' pockets. And for instance, we can learn about out-of-pocket spending for mental health or substance use services, in particular settings or from particular types of providers. And although it is national in scope, the MEPS data set is large enough to allow for California specific estimates. For questions about smaller subsets of the data, for example, spending on autism treatments for California children and young adults, it might be necessary to pool multiple years of data to get reliable results. Um, and also of note, the MEPS out-of-pocket spending variable includes payments for out-of-plan events, but does not differentiate them from other out-of-pocket payments, such as co-payments and deductibles. So OCA will need to develop a methodology to estimate that split. <laughs> OCA is currently working on this supplemental analysis and will be providing updates to the advisory committee and the board as we progress. And of course, we'll also share any updates with this, this work group as well. So we're also often asked about the differences and the relationships between OCA's data collection and the Healthcare Payments Database, or HPD. So we included this slide to provide a high-level comparison of these two distinct HCI data collections. OCA's mandate is to collect data from payers on their total healthcare expenditures and on the portions of those totals that are going towards primary care and behavioral health. HCI is also responsible for collecting and maintaining the healthcare payments database, which is California's all payer claims database for other uses. So starting with the types of data collected, the HPD collects individual claims and counters from submitters, while OCA will collect aggregate data from payers on their behavioral health and other spending. In terms of data submitters, both OCA and the HPD collect data from commercial and Medicare Advantage payers. Regarding analyses, the OCA data collection will measure aggregate annual behavioral health spending at the state and the payer levels. The HPD can supplement this information by enabling drill down into claim level detail. For example, the HPD could be used to analyze behavioral health spending associated with specific provider types or specific care settings. And of note, neither the OCA submissions nor the HPD include out of plan spending, which is why OCA is working on the MEPS analysis that we just discussed. Um, so 
So moving on now to our main focus for today's meeting, defining behavioral health spending. We wanted to start with the updates we've made to our proposed goals based on your feedback from last month's rich discussion. Um, so first, we removed the reference to a behavioral health system in the title of the slide. Under accessible, we've clarified that accessibility refers to both providers and services and that they should be available both when and where needed to address geographic disparities. Providers can be broadly defined to include peer specialists and community health workers, for example. We added linguistically concordant to culturally responsive in that second bullet. And we also want to note that affordable includes attention to the out of plan spending we've just discussed. Under comprehensive, we revised the second bullet to include ambulatory settings and reduced need for care in emergency departments and correctional facilities. Under coordinated, we're emphasizing that services should be integrated across behavioral health settings and with primary care. Under equitable, we've reversed the order of the bullets to emphasize our goal of reducing disparities. And finally, under high quality, we moved improve outcomes up for emphasis and made explicit that the goal is to improve outcomes for behavioral health and for health overall. So we've also updated our logic model illustration after the last meeting to reflect your feedback. Um, so in this current version, we can see that starting on the left side, we have a two-way relationship between the system-wide behavioral health goals from the previous slide and California stakeholder actions. In one direction, the system-wide behavioral health goals motivate stakeholders' actions, which should in turn result in movement toward the goals, which are more accessible, comprehensive, coordinated, equitable, and high-quality behavioral health care. On the right side, <clears throat> we can see that OCA's, see OCA's role in the model. And our efforts to promote high value health care include this behavioral health work stream. The measurement, reporting, and benchmarking that will come out of this work stream give California stakeholders information and analysis to support their actions in pursuit of the system wide behavioral health goals. So I'll pause here to hear from, uh, from you all about these updated goals and our refined description of OCA's role in improving behavioral health outcomes, as well as any comments or questions you may have about our data sources and out of plan spending work stream. Please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Yeah, Beth. Good morning. Um, first of all, thank you for the um, revisions to the goals. I think that uh, we may want to come back at some future as as we have these conversations and learn more. But I think that what you've already done strengthens um, the objectives and. Um, um, second, am I the only person who can't see the content? Um, cause it's my screen says can't display content. So, um, I hope I'm the only one with that challenge. Um, but, um, going back to the goals in a larger sense, I, you know, we start off with measuring what is, um, what is going on now? And I very much appreciate the effort to measure out of plan spend as well. But, uh, you know, we have an obj we, we, the objective here is to go to a better place. And so continuing to work on how to define that will be really important. And it was an important part of our work on primary care. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate that input. And Carrie. Hi, good morning. Um, I also appreciate uh, the changes um, that were made to slide 11 um, uh, in terms of the updated proposed goals. Um, just a couple sort of um, uh, small changes um, that we would suggest, I think, under uh, comprehensive uh, care um, and reducing the need um, in EDs, we uh, for emergency departments and correctional facilities, we would also add um, inpatient and locked psychiatric facilities to that. Um, and then uh, under equitable care, 
um, we would suggest that it should be to reduce and, and eliminate uh, disparities, uh, racial, ethnic, linguistic, and other disparities. So um, I think that 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 would be our um, those would be our edits for that. Um, and then just I guess one last comment um, on reduced misinformation, stigma, and discrimination. Um, I'm not sure how misinformation and stigma, what that has to do with equity, essentially. Um, so just, I, I guess, I uh, would love to hear more about your, your thoughts there. Thank you. Thanks for those um, suggestions that we will take back. And then in terms of um, the relationship between stigma and misinformation, and equity, um, I think just we're thinking about how those can cause some some people and some groups of people potentially to have less access. Like if, if stigma is more pronounced in some communities than others, potentially that could contribute to inequities. Um, but welcome other folks from the team to add to that. I'm, I, I mean, think I that's can right. Add Go ahead. Go ahead Jeff, sorry. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say, I mean, there is a lot of doc documented evidence in certain groups, even by different socioeconomic, you know, sociodemographic variables that certain groups, there's more stigma in those communities, especially associated with substance use disorders and to some degree other behavioral health conditions. I, I would guess that's kind of what you're getting at HKI Oka folks and, and trying to figure out how to address that in a meaningful way to reduce to, to improve health equity in this space. Okay, that makes sense to me. Thanks, and uh, and I absolutely um, agree with, you know, wanting to reduce all of that. Um, I guess just, you know, um, I could see that in some of the other buckets as well, but I appreciate the explanation, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Um, Jeff, thank you for the um, kind of reduced need for higher levels of care, which, yeah, when we could produce a few examples, um, really appreciate all these take backs for us. And Hector. Uh, and one other word just you could use is restrictive levels of care. That's often a word used in behavioral health settings. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, yeah, just quickly, um, I just wanted to, to uh, um, uh, support uh, Carrie's uh, comment about um, the, uh, the change uh, and adding uh, reduced need for um, higher uh, settings of, of care, particularly uh, residential and lab facilities. Um, I would also add that uh, we may want to move away from the word need and use something like reliance on, because a lot of times it's not just about the need, but also overusing these settings when uh, another setting, lower uh, setting of care would be um, more appropriate for the, for the individual. Thank you, that's a great flag. <clears throat> any, any other comments before we move forward? Okay, so now we'll move into some of the details of our behavioral health spending measurement. And today we're gonna to start with a discussion of the framework for measurement. So as a reminder, we saw this last month, um, this is our proposed phased approach to defining and measuring behavioral health spending. Our initial measurement definition and data collection will focus on the commercial and Medicare Advantage markets to reflect OCA's data collection approach. The next step will be to adapt the commercial market definition to the Medi-Cal market, possibly using data sources that are specific to Medi-Cal and making refinements as needed. And then we will revise the definitions over time as we learn from experience. This is another graphic we saw before um, from the Millbank Memorial Fund's recommendations for a standardized state methodology to measure clinical behavioral health spending. Um, the section of the graphic shown in color 
It depicts clinical behavioral health services that are paid for by healthcare payers like commercial health plans and public payers such as Medi-Cal. And on this slide, we're zooming in on that part of the diagram that represents OCA's initial focus. Those clinical services that are paid for by public and private payers through claims and non-claims payment. As we've discussed, in the future, OCA will be exploring the possibility of using supplemental data sources to capture some of that other spending that was shown in gray on the previous slide, such as funding of services through the state budget, social supports that are covered by Medi-Cal, and direct spending by consumers. And here we list some of the key decisions that this work group will provide input on. Today, we'll be focusing on decisions around the components of claims-based spending, which is outlined in yellow here. <clears throat> um, this, this conversation will include which diagnoses, services, providers, and care settings OCA may include in a definition of claims-based behavioral health spending. In future meetings, we'll discuss defining non-claim spending. And all these decisions will inform what OCA will be able to measure and report whether mental health and substance use will be measured separately, for example, or how spending by care setting can be reported. Use cases for measurement and reporting will be balanced against considerations of data reliability and the burden on data submitters. The key decisions around benchmarking will include whether the aim should be to increase behavioral health spending across the board or to focus on particular conditions, care settings, or populations. And then finally, the work group will weigh in on defining the benchmark level and a timeline for achieving it. So um, we'll pause here again to hear your thoughts about this framework for me measuring behavioral health spending. Any, any comments or questions? Yes, Carrie, go ahead. Um, yeah, just on the previous slide um, with the Venn diagram, I just, I think we were just sort of um, puzzled by the social support behavioral health spend um, and what exactly that entails. Um, you know, certainly, uh, so, you know, fine to measure, um, but I'm just wondering, it seems like it's pretty, it would be pretty minim minimal. Um, I, you know, I know there's a tiny bit of support for health related social needs, um, but I'm not aware of what that would be on the commercial side. Um, and how how would we determine uh, if the spend is behavioral health related versus related to any other comorbid health condition? Um, I guess, you know, I, I it's it's great to, to see something here, but I'm just sort of wondering about the mechanics a little bit more of this. Yeah, Mary, Mary Jo, would you like to respond sure, to that? Sure, sure. So um, the, the first piece I would note is that uh, OCA is currently thinking about really focusing its initial measurement on the circles that are provided here in Technicolor um, versus those that are provided here in black and white. So the green, the orange, the, the sort of goldish, and then the blue. So um, Carrie, for many of the reasons that you just mentioned, um, including the complexity and sort of the lack of clarity on what would be, um, you know, social supports to support behavioral health versus another condition is why OCA is not contemplating focusing initial measurement in those areas. Um, this diagram was created uh, for a report that we uh, developed in partnership with Millbank that this graphic sort of aimed to identify all the different places um, where states may find behavioral health spending. So, for example, if you look at um, many Medicaid different many different Medicaid programs around the country, they may offer support with workforce or housing or other types of social needs. And sometimes those programs are directed specifically um, to assist individuals with a behavioral health diagnosis. Um, so thank I appreciate that. So it's really the color I'm hearing. It's really the color circles that um, you're focusing on for initial spending. And then in terms of the example, the other the grays are there as an example. Um, and 
the, the examples in particular are Medica Medicaid um, examples as opposed to commercial? Typically, yes, those programs are intended to support individuals um, covered under Medicaid programs. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Go ahead, Beth. <clears throat> and by the way, um, have you resolved your technical difficulties? I'm not sure how to help with that, but hope that nope. we can get you. No, nope. nope, but but fortunately, I had printed printed out on paper, so old tech, the uh, slide, so I can follow along. Thank you for asking. Um, I do. Th I mean, I understand the phased approach and appreciate that, especially on a challenge like this. We knew behavioral health would be hard. Um, I do think given the important role of um, and historic role of county mental health that um, for those with severe mental illness, um, as well as drug medical, that those are important pieces of the puzzle going forward in California. And I, that's one of those, I have no idea how other states do it, but at least in California, it's a big deal and it's been a big deal since Governor Reagan closed the uh, mental hospitals. So, you know, that's kind of a long time and kind of a big part of our system. So, um, and I, you know, it's yet another place where the work of OCA intersects with DHCS and having a deep understanding of the role, not just the Medicaid program in the sense of paying for traditional physical health, but the very complex silos of behavioral health um, is something that we will need to get to. It doesn't have to be in the first wave, but we will need to get there. And it will be until we do it. will We won't have the kind of picture we need of what we're doing now and also where we should be going. Um, so and, you know, this administration's done more than on on this topic than any administration in my recollection. So that's not a criticism. That's a building on what this administration already does. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. And we are um, currently actively working with DHCS to make sure that in the future we can incorporate a lot of these things that are um, important parts of the system that are not um, not currently in OCA's data collection for this first year, but they will be. Um, Can I add so, a brief word on that, Debbie? Oh, just super, course, Jeff, super yeah. Beth. So Beth, in the background, there are conversations going on between DHCS and OCA about some of those nuances that you're mentioning that are, of course, specific to Medi-Cal and, and related expenditures um, in that bottom right section on, on slide 15. Um, so those conversations are happening. It includes the behavioral health division folks, because I'm not necessarily the, of course, be all end all to behavioral health and medical. That is not my expertise. So there, those conversations are happening so we can think about and strategize around those nuances, big nuances. Yeah, yeah well, and it's it's a big deal and it's a big deal and I'm glad to hear that it's a big deal and it's also a big deal in terms of the variability of how care is delivered in different parts of California. Um, and I will go back to my truism that it should not be true that the LA County Jail is the largest mental health institution in the world. Um, and that in San Francisco, they take you to SF General in LA, they take you to jail. Um, that's, you know, we'll know we're making progress when that isn't true anymore. That's, I have a very simple my you know we have to we have to have some simple simple goals as well as all the complicated ones. Thank you. Thanks, Beth and Stephanie. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. This is Stephanie Berry with uh, Anthem. I just had a question or something to consider um, when looking at the um, behavioral health spend as to where um, employee 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 assistance programs are actually captured in here, because in many cases, um, you know, employees are getting um, a certain number of, of uh, behavioral health um, visits a year that's not necessarily captured in their normal um, uh, health plan, you know, spending. So if it's in the healthcare play, payer area or in the non-claims, it's something to consider as well. Yeah, thank you. And Mary Jo, do you want to speak a little bit more to our plans on that? 
Sure. Um, Stephanie, that's a tough one because the the data that is currently collected under the THCE would not include those kind of expenditures. Um, one challenge, for example, is that, you know, particularly self-insured employers may be establishing those contracts outside of the third-party administrator that they use to administer their health benefit or even their behavioral health benefit. So, um, would love um, to brainstorm with you more on potential, um, you know, options. But at this point, um, the plan is is to not be able to collect that data at least initially. Thanks, and Katrina. Yeah, hi. Um, just wondering if um, there's a way to. Just building off of what Beth had met, had said, that there's a way to drill down on the spend in different categories. Um, so, for example, measuring um, SUD separately um, or specialty behavioral health, because they're, you know, there's they're separate systems. They're two different. They're separate systems at the moment, and so we won't really be able to tell how much is being spent in each system or for each service um if it's all combined um and also you know because for example like sud service the only sud service that can be provided in fqhc is medicated assisted treatment so just trying to figure out like how much is actually being invested in the different systems so if there's a way to maybe drill down on on the different systems and the spend there <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Katrina. There's, I think, a couple of different components to that. It's, one is measuring um, mental health versus SUD treatment in general, and then the other is the differences between the commercial and the public delivery systems that are then further bifurcated into especially mental health versus SUD. So we are looking at all of those, and we'll discuss um, our definition refining it by diagnosis to, to at least reach that first piece of dividing um, between mental health and substance use disorder in just a little bit in a few minutes. So thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions or comments before we continue? Okay. So next, uh, we're going to review considerations and trade-offs of some of the key decisions for measuring behavioral health spending that's paid via claims. So claims payments include information about diagnosis, care setting, and provider, among other things. And each of these elements of claims can be considered in defining behavioral health expenditure or not. Currently, uh, three states, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, have identified have defined behavioral health for the purposes of measurement of spending. And the Millbank Memorial Fund has published recommendations for a standardized definition with input from states and other experts. So this slide shows how these states and the Millbank recommendations approach the key decisions that we'll be discussing today. So the first decision is whether to restrict by diagnosis, <clears throat> which is to say that data submitters would include a set of diagnosis codes in their queries to identify claims for behavioral health care. All three states and the Millbank Memorial Fund restrict their definitions by diagnosis. The second decision is whether to categorize behavioral health services by care settings, such as inpatient or outpatient. Maine, Massachusetts, and Millbank all categorized services by care setting. And then the final decision is whether to limit measurement to certain providers. Limiting to certain providers would mean including a list of taxonomy codes that count as behavioral health providers in the data submission instructions. Um, and currently only Maine limits its definition to certain providers. So in just a moment, we'll discuss considerations and trade-offs for each of these three decisions in more detail. Um, but first, I wanted to review OCA's key use cases for behavioral health spending measurement that will inform our decisions about how to structure our behavioral health spending definition. So first, as required by statute, OCA will measure behavioral health spending as a percentage of total health care expenditures, or THCE. 
Oka also wants to understand spending on mental health care and substance use disorder services and to understand the distribution of healthcare spend of behavioral health spending across different types of services and care settings, including primary care. And finally, we want to establish a focused benchmark for behavioral health spending that supports statewide goals and priorities. Some analyses, such as understanding the portion of THCE that's spent on behavioral health services in an outpatient setting, may be best served by OCA's data collection, whereas other more complex analyses might be best served by the HPD. So now we'll review each of these three key decisions for claims-based spending individually. And as a reminder for this first decision, all the existing state behavioral health definitions do restrict by diagnosis. Restricting by diagnosis can be, hel can be helpful because it's necessary if we want to measure substance use disorder and mental health spending separately. Um, it's needed to capture spending by non-behavioral health clinicians like primary care providers and in non-behavioral health care settings, such as the emergency department or acute care hospitals, where many of the services are for non-behavioral health care. And it's also needed for measurement of any benchmark that focuses on specific diagnoses. On the other hand, um, including diagnosis codes in the definition for behavioral health doesn't align with OCA's approach to measuring primary care. It's helpful to keep in mind that primary care spending measurement tracks spending on a defined set of services provided by a particular set of providers. And this is different from behavioral health spending measurement, which is tracking spending associated with care to treat specific conditions or diagnoses. So considering these differences in purpose, the, the difference in approach between primary care and behavioral health might make sense. If OCA does decide to restrict by diagnosis, several questions follow, including which diagnoses should we include? Should we only include claims with a primary behavioral health diagnosis? Or should we also include claims where a behavioral health diagnosis, uh, diagnosis is listed in a secondary or tertiary position? And should we filter by diagnosis in the same way across all provider and facility types? So here's an example of a state approach to restricting by diagnosis. Massachusetts Center for Health Information and Analysis, or CHIA, uses diagnosis codes to identify claims with a principal mental health diagnosis and those with a principal substance use disorder diagnosis. And this allows the state to quantify and compare mental health and substance use disorder spending, spending separately. Our second key decision for determining our, our approach to measuring behavioral health claims spending is whether to categorize services by care setting. Maine, Massachusetts, and the Millbank Memorial Fund all categorize behavioral health spending by care setting. And doing this provides opportunities to monitor and report on spending in specific care settings of interest, such as services provided via telehealth or in a residential setting, for example. And here we see the claims service categories that the Millbank Memorial Fund approach uses. Their methodology utilizes a funnel or decision tree approach that begins with diagnosis. It then defines each service category and subcategory using a combination of codes such as revenue, HICPICS or CPT service codes, and place of service codes. Spending on behavioral health and primary care is also limited by taxonomy codes, and prescription drug spending is identified using national drug codes, often referred to as NDC codes. Separate sets of service codes and subcategories can be developed for mental health and substance use disorder care. And in this approach, measurement occurs at the subcategory level, and subcategories are then rolled up into categories as, as shown here on the slide. And our final key decision is whether to restrict by provider type. To do this, we would need to develop a list of behavioral health provider taxonomies. Maine leverages provider type to help identify behavioral health spending. 
Another option could be to use taxonomy only when identifying behavioral health spending in primary care. And Millbank uses primary care provider taxonomies to help identify that behavioral health spending in the primary care setting. <clears throat> The Millbank Advisory Group also noted that all payer claims databases, such as California's HPD, could be used to conduct analyses of behavioral health care delivery by specific provider types. If OCA decides to restrict by provider type, we would need to discuss which types of providers to include versus exclude, and whether we should include a limited set of providers for all care settings or only for some, such as primary care. So to identify a claim as behavioral health spending, the main quality forum or MQF requires the claim to include one of the following, either a primary diagnosis code indicating that the purpose of the treatment was to address a behavioral health issue, or the claim could be for any service delivered by a provider, provider taxonomy whose claims are primarily for the treatment of mental health or substance use conditions. And MQF defines primarily as when 70% or greater of the provider's claim payments had a primary behavioral health diagnosis. Um, some examples of provider taxonomies that the MQF includes, which are shown in this blue box here, are psychologists, social workers, peer specialists, and residential treatment facilities. And one additional note is that the MQF currently does not report results by provider type. And so now we'd like to open it up for discussion. Um, this table shows again the decisions made by the other states that currently measure and the Millbank recommendations with a line added for California at the bottom. So we'd like to hear your perspectives on whether the OCA behavioral health definition should restrict by diagnosis, should categorize services by care setting and or restrict to certain provider types. Um, and, and what should OCA consider and prioritize as it's making these decisions? And uh, we'll start with Sarah. Good morning. Um, there's a lot in there. I almost kind of wish we would have like paused at each one. <laughs> um, but um, so on the diagnosis, uh, I, I, my opinion is that have to start with restricting a diagnosis at sort of the top of the funnel. Um, and um, from it just and then separate on the mental health and the, the substance use side. So I'm in support of that. Um, in the different service categories, I would like to see an additional row or stratification between inpatient and outpatient and that be like higher levels of care or diversionary level, like we can call it, but that's where I would want to see. So I would actually, so partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, um, crisis stabilization, crisis residential, um, that level of care um, doesn't, it's not inpatient and it's not plain outpatient. And so I think it needs its own span. Um, and that there you can easily identify that by specific CPT and HICPIC codes. Um, the provider taxonomy, um, the so there's within primary care and outside of primary care, and I think they need to, I do think they maybe need special considerations. So if you restrict within primary care by taxonomy, you're going to miss all of the prescriptions that PCPs write. Um, and so do we want that, do we want those visits that PCPs are writing to be, which is a huge portion of the prescriptions that get written, to be counted as behavioral health visits or not? Um, I don't, I don't know if I have an opinion right now on that, but I do think that's like, if you restrict by provider taxonomy to only those that you've listed within a primary care setting, you're going to miss all of those visits and not spend. Um, the provider taxonomy list here is very, it, it, 
it's very like Medicare commercial sort of mapping um, from a taxonomy. It doesn't on the Medicaid side. There's a lot of additional taxonomy types that would not be included if you restricted it to this list. So like, I don't have them in front of me, but um, more of the, the community-based um, sort of uh, community-based mental health center type taxonomy codes aren't included here. And so you're gonna wanna include those taxonomy codes as well on the Medicaid side. Um, so um, those are some thoughts and I don't have sort of hard and fast opinions formed on all of them, but just some considerations. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Those are important flags. And I can say that for the primary care and behavioral health, we're gonna be talking more internally and with you all about how we're gonna define this behavioral health in primary care module, which is especially tricky and important. So appreciate that flag. Um, and in terms of the provider taxonomies, that uh, the list there on that slide was uh, uh, some examples from the main definition, and we are very um, aware and will, as we're defining the list, we'll want uh, input from all of you about any that we, you know, might be missing in various settings and, um, um, you know, provider types. So that that list was not intended to be a comprehensive list at all. But thank you. Thank you for that. And does anyone else um, from our OCA FHC team have anything to add to Sarah's comments? Okay. Um, Nicole. I, oh, no, actually, sorry. <laughs> Parnica, you're next. Thank you. Um, so I'm Parnika Saxena. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, so I, I, I had two comments. My first one was about um, echoing the earlier point about restricting to certain provider types. Uh, I personally worked in a community health center for five years in Massachusetts, actually, and I did see this being a really a, a big problem. And we saw this as an issue with Medicare patients where they could not receive really important services because of the restriction to certain provider types because they couldn't quote and build for them. Um, I, the one example I can just give from a from a behavioral health standpoint is that taxonomy of saying counselors and psychologists and often um, I think it's important to, um, to, uh, to expand the definition of counselors. People often see them as just PhDs, but social workers also provide counseling very importantly to a, to a massive population, LMFTs, MFTs. So I think we definitely need to make sure that if there is a restriction, uh, we, we include all the providers that offer very important services that often you know, gets missed because they, uh, might be a part of the fine print. I've earlier talked about the role of community health workers, who I very strongly feel provide a very important liaison between patients and provi providers, especially uh, with patients who come from, um, you know, from uh, socioeconomic underprivileged backgrounds. Um, so that was one comment. And the other one, um, I guess, is more of a question. Uh, when we talk about restricting by diagnosis, you talk, you know, this is talk about measuring SUD and uh, mental health issues separately, which does make sense. But I also wonder, especially when you're both on an outpatient, I would say, especially with patients with severe illnesses, both an outpatient and, and a higher level setting, patients don't come with just, check, you know, they don't come and meet checkboxes. A lot of people have um, overlapping symptoms of substance use, mental health issues, as well as medical and, you know, non-psychiatric medical issues. And I want to ensure that kind of complexity is something that's measured because it often takes a lot more time, a lot more coordination, not just in the clinic, but outside as well to get such patients the help and the services they need. That, that was just my two cents, thanks. Thank you. And we're really looking forward to discussing more of these nuances in upcoming, um, upcoming meetings. So appreciate all of that input. Um, Nicole. Yeah, I think I can be brief. Thanks, Debbie. And, and so far, um, most I think of what Sarah said, um, Parnika said, all makes a lot of sense. Um, and to your point, Debbie, there's probably a lot of nuance in here, particularly in the in the non um, psychiatric clinical space. So the primary care of GYN, all of that. And I'm thinking that that's where the diagnostic pieces will help us define better where uh, if it's the reason for a visit, if it's the secondary 
diagnosis coded or something, that there's some limit in where that diagnosis appears in the non-psychiatric uh, provider base, if that makes sense. I think that might help us um, refine better. And agree um, with Parnica that um, the provider types, if we're really looking at the clinical spend, that seems like the starting point to me, like the first path um, of what's included and what's not included. So just bracketing, I know we have to discuss the non-psychiatric OBGYN, et cetera, space. Um, because, and within that, that um, to the most recent point, that's also got to be broad to include those NSWs, those folks that are in kind of the integrated care areas where they may, we're going to miss them and those, you know, essential care management pieces that oftentimes make what's been prescribed or what's been designed in a treatment plan, make those go right and make them go continue down the path that we intend as clinicians so i want to put a, a plug in there for not wrap around so much as it is the things that facilitate care are just as important and, and hoping we can find a way to include those maybe it's in the provider type uh those might be you know cpt codes but they're not necessarily going to be care setting or diagnostic that's my only add for now. Thank you. And yeah, Mary, Mary Jo, did you have um, something to say about how we, we plan to do that? I, that is really important flag. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it's really tricky, honestly, because, you know, the data that we um, have available uh, will be claims information, non-claims information, not clinical information. And so to the extent that in some instances, those supportive services are not billed for in a discrete way, um, I think that's going to be a little bit challenging. That being said, there are an increasing number of codes um, to support um, and to sort of identify those services. And so making sure that we include those will be important. Also, I'll note that the expanded framework has um, specific uh, subcategories related to integrated behavioral health and support for social services. And so thinking about uh, those will be important also. Yeah, if I could add something to that, and Mary Jo, thanks for describing that, because I think, um, so just as an example with, with Blue Shield, the work that we do to support the uh, rollout of the collaborative care model, um, and that would then, those are, you know, five, six CPT codes that specifically point to the care provided in a, in a I guess, non-traditional psychiatric clinical setting, but for those who aren't going to go otherwise, right? And so their OBGYN is who they're going to, or their pediatrician, you know, whatever that is. And the other, a, 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 um, a big piece of that is physician and practice education, where they're, to your point, already doing it and not realizing that they can capture and, and charge for that or, or what that looks like. And so, um, which is fine that, you know, part of the part of the gig and what we're trying to advocate for and help and consult with those medical groups on. And now if we're talking about what we spent last year versus what we spent the next year, that's gonna show up as new when in fact it was already occurring, just not being billed for. So that's something also like a little bit of a confounding variable maybe to, and it might be a small enough end that it doesn't make as much of a difference, but I want to, I think maybe at least talk through. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Beth. Well, I, I want to go back to where Sarah started, which is I wish, I wish in some ways we'd had, um, this much conversation on each of these questions. Um, so a couple of, uh, everything up to now has been very thoughtful and helpful and I, I, valuable contributions. Um, I'm trouble, I'm, I have mixed feelings and it may just be the framing about restricting by diagnose, by diagnosis. Um, I am mindful that we have had diagnoses emerge and I'm thinking and it's now old news but autism comes to mind as something 
where there hadn't been attention and it took a fair amount of um, organized consumer advocacy to bring it into the discussion about what should be covered. Um, I also conversely understand um, we're not going, not everything's behavioral health. Um, and I also want to second the, um, I think it was Parnika talking about, you know, so often substance abuse and mental health are comorbid and they are also com you know, compounded by other physical needs. And somehow we're going to have to find a way to um, address those if we're going to actually meet what's the larger goal here, which is not just measurement, but actually moving us forward to a place where we're managing people's care well enough. Um, and so I just want to keep us there. That's what we're. That's why we're all here is to have the conversation about how to do that. Um, and so, I do think when I look at slide twenty, a lot of it's focused on measuring what goes on now. Um, and but I think we're actually set a harder task, which is thinking about where we want to end, go. Um, and so, as I think about the benchmark. In some ways, the task that we were set on primary care was easier because we knew what more adequate access to primary care looked like. I think this conversation um, is very important in helping to illuminate how complicated the uh, behavioral health world is going to be to get our arms around. And so um, to go back and say how much I appreciate the phased approach in that context. One other point on um, service categories and um, which is we're going to need to dis distinguish between those times when it's a screening and referral and when people actually get treatment for their condition. And I don't know if the CPT codes allow us to do that. If they do, that'll be great. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, and we'll go on next to Kirsten, but also we have enough time that we can go back to each of those three three decisions. So I'll let Kirsten and Hector go, and then we can um, back up a few slides and focus in on, on each of the three uh, individually. So go ahead, Kirsten. Thank you. Um, really appreciate that we have other states to look to um, as a guidepost. And I think, you know, totally seconding Beth and Sarah's request that we be given an opportunity to dig in a little bit more deeply on each of these decision points, um, because I think they are really important. Um, just a couple of observations here. There is, for some reason, a difference between, um, on this current chart, restricting versus categorizing, um, and that's something worth thinking through. Um, you know, why would we <laughs> restrict by diagnosis? Don't they all matter equally? I'm not really sure how other states approach that. So knowing a little bit more about, you know, if these other states chose certain ones, why did they chose, choose those? Um, and versus just categorizing by, you know, by different types of, um, you know, for example, mood disorders versus psychotic disorders, et cetera. Um, and then one other kind of question that doesn't need to be answered now, but would be helpful if we are going to have a conversation about different settings um, and kind of the inherent judgments we kind of make about whether spending in those settings are good or bad <laughs> or are just um, reflections of at least people are getting care um, is that, you know, maybe there are national studies or um, academic experts who can help us understand or look at how other states have approached this. But, you know, considering that both mental illness and um, substance use disorders um, tend to be chronic illnesses where you can have, um, it's okay to have episodes of acute illness. Um, and, and yet we can also go upstream and prevent acute illness from occurring. Um, just want to kind of flag that we need to kind of better understand what we should expect to see in terms of spending in those different settings versus like us just making our own personal judgments about, you know, all ED visits are bad because I disagree with that. I mean, I think at least people got care and sometimes that is the entry point for care, even if it's maybe not our ideal. 
Um, so just kind of flagging a couple of points and thanking you all for your work to present this to us today. I have a scheduling conflict, so I have to hop off before you end, but look forward to the next conversation. Thank you. And I just want to, for one point of clarification on restricting by diagnosis, our, our goal, if we were to choose to do that, is to be very inclusive of all behavioral health diagnoses, but in some care settings, like an emergency department, you don't want to count all care in an emergency department. You want to find the care that's for any type of behavioral health. So we're not trying to restrict within behavioral health, but we're trying to exclude care that is has nothing to do with behavioral health at all. So um, hopefully that that's helpful and reassuring on that point. And yeah, we'll go back in just a moment to each each of these individually. But first, um, Hector. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, and uh, Hector, uh, Hector with, with NHELP. Um, uh, I uh, thank you for that uh, clarification. I think that's that's really important because I, I'm I'm, uh, I'm also uh, thinking about uh, the implications of restricting, and I think it's important to be um, uh, uh, as inclusive as possible. Um, although we do want to see the data categorized by different um, uh, um, settings and services, right? Um, my main point is on uh, on the question about uh, categorizing the services and settings, which I, in fact I think there's um, a little bit of, of uh, conflation here between um, uh, uh, services and settings. I think in 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 some slides we say uh, services categories, and in others we say um, settings. I think, um, and I think that's uh, that's an important distinction to uh, to keep in mind, right? Um, uh, and I think we, we we've mentioned this before, but uh, this idea of uh, knowing what are the the specific services that are being provided in different types of settings is important, right? So, like in this this example from uh, I'm sorry, I'm going through the these slides on my my own trying to uh, get it right, but there was one uh, example where um, they um, they talk about uh, I don't know if it was uh, Millbank or, or another state. Uh, but they talk about the um, uh, inpatient facilities and then prescription drug treatment as a separate uh, category. Uh, but we also want to know whether people are receiving access to prescription drugs in inpatient facilities, right? Like what type of services are they getting um, in those facilities uh, is, is an important uh, uh, consideration. Um, so I would try to separate, I, I don't know if, if Milbank does this or other states uh, did this, but I think it's important to try to separate the categories and the settings, right? The categories of services, what are the services that people are, are getting, and then the, the the settings and and what are the services they are getting in each of the uh, of those settings. All of that um, information uh, will be important. Um, uh, and then, I, uh, in terms of the uh, of the actual uh, services, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to this uh, later. But um, I, I see the example of pres prescription drugs. I would also highlight the importance of preventive services and screening services for uh, behavioral health conditions. That may be an important category to to consider. Um, and then, as a as a, a setting, uh, again, it could be a setting or, or service, but I think it, 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 it's a it better it, it's better defined as a setting. Uh, opioid treatment programs, right, which can be included in some ways in in prescription drug uh, treatment, uh, but is more specific to uh, uh, a particular type of treatment for uh, opioid use disorders in, in the case of, of methadone. So, um, uh, getting information about the 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 number of, of uh, claims for, for that specific setting, I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I will say we, if for reference, the technical specifications for the Millbank methodology are available uh, if you'd like to look at that. And Mary Jo, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add um, in response to Hector's comments. Uh, no, I think that's a, a, a great call out. And I would also add that, you know, as Debbie shared earlier, some analyses um, may be ones that OCA would want to partner with the healthcare payments database on where it starts to get into sort of more granular views um, of the types of services provided um, versus having that be part of the OCA data collection. But I think that's a, a good topic for us to dive into in the future. Thank you. Let's see. So um, 
I know I see Carrie and Parnica um, with hands raised. I'm thinking maybe since we're on the service category slide, do we want to have comments on this particular area? And then we can move to each other one. So Carrie, was, was um, your comment related to service categories? No, uh, sorry, I've just I've been in queue for a little bit, um, oh. but I'm happy to I'm happy to hold if others want to comment on that. I just had a, a very quick uh, comment overall. OK, um, yeah, I think if it's OK, I'll, I'll ask you to <laughs> hold for just a moment and I promise to come back to you. Um, Parnika, did you have something about service categories? Great, go ahead. I did, yes. Uh, so I just want to preface this by saying I really appreciate um, how you all are uh, really taking the time to get, you know, to really look at the nuances. Uh, I just had a, I thought about this when, about the earlier comment when we were talking about categorizing by diagnosis versus in, uh, in care settings. Um, and I think we should, I just want, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that Although this is this is everything that we're doing is really important, but it's also important to rem to remember that the way our healthcare system is set up right now in California, on a practical from a practical standpoint, it is not functioning the way it should be ideally. And by that I mean, patients who should be getting care outpatient are not able to get it outpatient, or the wait times are so long that if we depend on the fact that oh, if you're inpatient or if you're in the emergency room, only the you know, these are the certain diagnoses that you should be presenting there with, or we will cover only if it's if your patient meets criteria for this diagnosis. We are, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the patients who are coming to emergency rooms, especially for psychiatric and behavioral health issues, more and more are people who should not be there and are there because they're not enough outpatient providers to care for them. And the problem is that even if they have an outpatient provider, or let's say they got linked with somebody, they're not going to be able to meet with somebody for three, four, five months. And, and by then, their so-called mild to moderate problem is going to become is going to turn into a severe problem. So even if somebody, let's say, hypothetically comes in with a mild to moderate anxiety issue, which is not technically an ER level of care, it is important that it gets addressed because they're most likely not going to be able to meet with an outpatient provider for another six months by when this might become an an you know, very difficult thing that, you know, to address and a patient like this might need inpatient level of care. Um, I see this myself on an inpatient setting where I often see people who come in who are suicidal, but they're not going to commit suicide right away. They came in because they know things are getting worse. They are too sick to be maintained on an outpatient level of care. And that's why they come to seek care in the hospital. And often, you know, even though as a, as a psychiatrist, I might think it's right for them to be here. I often get so many denials for them being there. And the patient is the one who ends up suffering because uh, guess what? They live in a very rural area of California where there's no psychiatrist or they go to, you know, a, a, a community health center where the psychiatrist has 3000 patients on the panel and can't see them weekly, which is what they need. So we you know, and there might not be a residential program that their insurance covers or one that's available for them. I also see a lot of people, because I work a lot with older adults who have medical health issues, so they don't meet criteria for these in-between levels of care. And these are the people who we think are minorities, but are actually not, because we are seeing them more and more. And they might have been, and you know, maybe this problem is worsening because of COVID. This might be happening because of the mental health epidemic. Whatever the reason might be, we are seeing more and more people who don't necessarily meet these clean criteria that we hope they meet, and yet they get turned away or they get humongous bills and they're struggling with it for weeks on end and we actually end up worsening their distress rather than helping them. So I think it's important for us to keep in mind that maybe some of the criteria that we thought were appropriate for these more higher levels of care, or levels of care maybe two or three years ago, might not be the case anymore. Um, and again, not trying to make things more complicated, but I, I just want to make sure that we keep that in mind when we are uh, when we are making these decisions. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to repeat something that Margareta put in the chat, which is that some of these things, like helping people get care in the outpatient setting in a timely manner, 
it is one example of a potential focus for our benchmark where we really want to um, to um, prioritize increased investment in areas that are going to make the most difference to outcomes um, for patients. So thank you for for all of that. Um, and Beth. Just to emphasize again that it in this conversation really is striking in terms of the reality of what Californians face. The And someone in the chat is calling it the mismatch between what people need and what's available. But it's also, we can measure where we are. I think the much harder task is to create, and it may be a series of benchmarks, um, a vision of where we should be um, and everything that goes with that. Um, and I do, <laughs> the longer term vision um, is one thing and we need to have that longer term vision, um, but we also need intermediate steps to get us there. So um, the task before us here is the need is so great. That's what this conversation reinforces for me, and so widespread. So, and and the mismatch with what's available is bad, and not getting better as fast as it as people need it to. So, thank Thanks, you. Beth. Yeah, thank you. Um, and let's see, before we go on to another service, another one of our key decision categories, Carrie, I wanted to make sure to come back to, to you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, I really appreciate this rich conversation. Um, and, you know, I I just, I want to align my, my uh, support or comments, you know, with um, what others have talked about, for example, on the importance of not restricting, being too restrictive and how we're categorizing providers or how we're, you know, looking at, um, you know, current spend versus, you know, and, and versus what we would like to see spending um, look like. Um, my just one last point was, and maybe we're getting to the um, setting conversation, but I just wanted to do a plus one for um, categorizing care by setting, just because I think, um, you know, as Beth and others have mentioned, this this is also, um, you know, yes, we want to measure um, ER spending on behavioral health, and, and we understand that for some folks, that's where, that's the first place they go. Uh, for many people, that's the first place they go to get um, health care. Uh, and, you know, if we have a functioning system that's affordable, that's accessible, that communities can actually use, then ideally, you know, we would ultimately see more uh, spending in behavioral uh, out, outpatient settings or in other types of settings. Uh, and so, you know, I think we're 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 sort of at this, you know, um, crossroads right between um, what between the need and um, an in inability to access services and where we would like to ultimately go in terms of um, behavioral health spending. And so um, just, you know, just putting just a, a, a double plus one on on all of that. Um, and I just wanted to share those those thoughts as well. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. There's a lot here. And um, yeah, Jeff. Yeah, I just I'm just looking at listening to the comments and looking at the chat, Margaret's comment. I, I wonder if looking at both, you know, we could start to look at percentages to start to answer some of these questions. I think there's a lot of hypotheses we might be able to test things we don't really know, like what percentage of the spend is on the, the type of BH spend we want versus the global spend. And and we don't really know what we would what what the target would be or what the goals with that data would be, but we're not even measuring it to determine where we might want to go and what might be appropriate. So it lets us start maybe asking questions about the larger behavioral health system. So I I just I, I like the direction this is going. I think a both and approach might start to address different questions and help generate different hypotheses to help improve behavioral health delivery broadly. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And Sarah. Yeah, I have a question about, so on the diagnosis, 
um, what diagnoses are included? When is that going to be at a next work group meeting? Because that's a whole other uh, discussion in it of itself that may require the full amount of time. <laughs> Just like neurological included out, you know, not included like TBI. Like there's so many things that go could go either way. So I think. Um, I guess my plug is to set aside enough time at a future work group, maybe just to talk about what diagnoses are included. And then, and, and then subsequently the implications of including those diagnoses on different taxonomies and provider types and et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be continuing these discussions and Again, Mary Jo, correct me if I'm wrong, but just as a kind of a reference for a background that the technical specifications that were released by Millbank gives their code set. So just to look at what what Millbank has done as a as a reference starting point um, can be helpful. That's absolutely right. And also, if you follow the link to the document that is uh, referenced on this slide, you can read a little bit about the areas of diagnoses, the types of conditions where the um, other states and experts had the most conversation. So, for example, um, you know, conditions related to dementia, for example, or conditions related to um, various, you know, um, developmental disorders and conditions. And I wonder, like, if the discussion when we get there, like, there's sort of there's pros and cons on both sides, right, of every decision. And so, if we maybe frame it somehow that way, around like. What are the and like you know potent the unintended consequences maybe of what if including some or not including some? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Julia, who's put the code set from the Millbank um, technical specifications in in the chat for anyone who wants to to dive into those details. Any other comments on diagnosis in particular? Okay. Oh, Catherine. Sorry for the late entry. Could you just say a little bit more about that last bullet on the left about alignment or not lack of alignment with primary care measurement approach? Oh, sure. On the diagnosis slide. Um, yeah, so yeah. when we're measuring primary care spending, we're really looking at a set of services that and provided by a set of providers in primary care and that um, it doesn't really matter what diagnosis it's for. It's all primary care. And so our primary care definition does not include any restriction by diagnosis. The restriction is by type of provider. Um, type of service and place of service. Whereas with behavioral health, um, we're really looking at treatment for behavioral health conditions, regardless of who's providing it or where it's being provided. And so being able to identify treatment that's for a behavioral health diagnosis um, may, may be important, at least in some, some settings where care is provided for many diagnoses, um, not just behavioral health diagnoses. Is that Thanks. is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, no, that is helpful. I just wanted to get that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that clarifying question. Uh, Beth, I saw your hand and then it went away. Well, I Go think ahead. you mostly answered it answering Catherine. Um, I would say, I mean, kind of, let me, isn't the point of our vision on primary care that you get most of your needs taken care of and that you know, they refer you to specialists when you need a specialist and isn't, I, I think there's, we need a longer and more thoughtful discussion about how primary care and behavioral health should be linked together. There's some things in the law that point in a particular direction, but I think this conversation starting with whoever made the observation that a whole lot of primary care doctors prescribe behavioral health meds um, uh, and 
you know, the recognition that lots of primary care doctors feel challenged by providing appropriate behavioral health. Um, I think we need a longer thoughtful discussion about where we are and where we think we should be going with respect to that interaction. But I do think the discussion on it, it may just be that if you said categorized by diagnosis, there'd be fewer questions. Thank you. We will we will work on uh, being really clear that we are intending to be very inclusive about behavioral health diagnoses and that this really is referring to um, settings of care where there's a large portion of the care is there's not really another way to identify which of the care is behavioral health or which is not. So in order not to undercount behavioral health care that's occurring, say, in the emergency department, we right. need a diagnosis filter um, because we certainly wouldn't want to include all care that's occurring for any reason in the emergency department. Um, it, and I would just add that given that this is not a one-year project, this is a long-term project, we will want to evolve um, as the diagnoses evolve, um, which I assume is built into your thinking, but it's important to say it out loud. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. We plan for both primary care and for behavioral health that our code sets will be evaluated and updated on a, probably an annual basis because there are definitely changes that occur over time. We have a few more minutes um, it, uh, before we move on to provider type. I think maybe we can move over to there and if and are there are any closing comments about provider type um, before we end. We do have a few minutes. You've all had many other things to say, so <laughs> feel free to, to chime in about um, provider type restrictions. Well, I think a number of people had very thoughtful things to say about um, Medicaid providers in, and that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, I would add that, and I'm not the one to do this, um, but some understanding of the behavioral health workforce um, I think it would be an important, it, both, and I understand workforce is the responsibility of another part of HCI, but sort of where we are in, and, um, you know, um, it's not just a question of having sufficient numbers, but of deployment, and that goes back to the out-of-plan spend issue um, and the adequacy of networks. So I think those conversations are going to um, we should be surfaced because otherwise they're just going to haunt this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Beth. And Sarah. Yeah, I just would say that the payers are pretty accustomed to sort of setting up dofers based on very similar filters of diagnoses, CPT codes, and taxonomies. And so, um, you know, really getting detailed comments from payers on if, if they see anything missing, because um, they've certainly negotiated many of these dofers <laughs> over time. And it's, it's reflect, it, it, there's, there's um, corollaries, right, between what we're trying to do and that. I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but just calling that out for actuary, get your actuaries to start looking at these CPT codes and taxonomy codes and diagnoses. Yeah, thank you for that flag. We'll want lots of eyes on our code sets before we finalize them. So thanks. Any any other last comments before I let Margareta close us out? <laughs> Debbie, I just had a quick uh, question. In terms of providers, did we talk about the all the primary care and, and you know, to Sarah's point about DOFERS, um, what is, you know, typically characterized as primary care? Because I, I thought I just saw, like, family medicine um, and, and ER on there. It was on another slide. Okay. Yeah, so for primary care, 
we were we we're planning to have um, a behavioral health in primary care module that will help us measure um, primary care that's occurring excuse me, behavioral health that's occurring in the primary care setting as defined by our primary care um, definition. So the primary care provider types that we've uh, determined in our primary care work stream would be the primary care providers that we would include in that module, um, which okay, is most great. especially, does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. Any other? Last comments. This has been great. I haven't had a chance to read the chat yet, but I look forward to it. All right, then I will hand it over to Margareta to close us out for today. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you all for this excellent discussion. I'm sorry, I missed the first few minutes. Um, we were sharing our primary care work in uh, a national meeting, so um, excited to share that work um, with a broader audience and um, share all of this great feedback from the work group um, that led us to our primary care definition. Um, for the October work group meeting, um, we are planning again to kind of recap what we discussed here in September. We'll start to discuss initial draft recommendations for measuring behavioral health care paid via claims. Um, and then, of course, uh, getting into another tricky issue of discussing trade offs to approaches for measuring behavioral health care paid via non claims. Um, and uh, as we aim to do always, we will take back all of your feedback and suggestions for what we should focus on in our coming meetings and how to approach that um, into our planning for the um, October meeting. And then lastly, just wanted to note that the November work group meeting has been rescheduled to Thursday, uh, November 21st. Um, it was previously scheduled for the 20th, which um, overlapped with an OCA board meeting. So we've rescheduled that. Um, I saw that many of you can make it. So hopefully many of you can make it to that rescheduled date in November. And um, I'll, with one minute left, are there any closing thoughts or any questions folks had? Okay, thank you so much uh, for all of the really amazing discussion today and thank you, Debbie, for facilitating. Have a, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you too. Thanks everyone.